Well, hey, King of Kings, and welcome to a brand new three-week series we're calling Asking for a Friend. We're going to tackle three big questions, give you God's answer to these questions. And I like the sermon series name, Asking for a Friend, because it kind of has that double meaning, you know, I'm asking for a friend, even though you're the friend that wants to know. You know what I'm talking about. We've all got those questions. So we got some big questions coming up over the next three weeks. Today, we're going to look at how do I deal with all of this stress? I think a pretty apt question on Mother's Day. Next week, we're going to look at, I think, the most important eternal question. Is Jesus really the only way? And then in the third week, a really current question. As a Christian, how do I live in a cancel culture world? Going to be awesome questions. And so, again, asking for a friend. These are questions that not only we're asking in the rooms we're listening to, but our friends are asking. And so here's my my plea to you. Invite your friends. They're asking these questions. This is relevant stuff everybody needs to hear. And so not only invite them to come to church on Sundays with you and to sit with you, but also you can share this content through the week and be helpful for the friends that might be asking. One more piece of business before we launch into today's question. We're only answering three questions over the next three weeks, but I know you have more questions. In fact, I bet we all have at least one. You know what I'm talking about? That one question that you have about God, faith, the church, the Bible, culture, that one question. So here's what I want you to do. I want to invite everyone at both campuses now to take your phone out and scan the QR code that's magically going to appear on the screen. And I want you to ask that question. What questions do you have? At the end of this series, for a few weeks from now, we're going to look at all the questions that have been submitted, and we're going to go on to our King of Kings Beyond Sunday podcast, and we're going to answer as many questions, give you God's wisdom in as many ways as possible. And so let's do this. How do I deal with all of this stress? We live in a really stressful nation. In fact, of the 195 countries that are recognized across the world, Gallup ranks us as the seventh most stressed nation. And not only do we live in a stressful nation, we live in a stressful city. The Within Reach State of the City project covered a lot of topics around mental health and and amazingly of all the data around mental health, the one that was lopsided negatively to Omaha adults comparatively to national adults is this topic of stress. In fact, here's the statistic from the study. 77% of adults in Omaha say they feel significant stress at least once or twice a month compared to just 61% of adults nationwide. We are living, for whatever reason, in one of the most stressed cities, in one of the most stressed nations in the world. If you are a living, breathing human being in Omaha right now, you likely are feeling stress. And the good news is that God's word says a lot about this. So we're going to dive into God's word. I'm also grateful for other pastors like Chris Hodges and Andy Stanley and Kerry Newhoff and Craig Groeschel, who've all said a lot about this and their thoughts are sprinkled in and throughout my message today. Um, But but I want to get really practical. But first, I want to share something with you that I, I think you want me to say. I think you want me to say that if you believe in and follow after Jesus, that you won't have stress. I wish I could say that, by the way. That'd be awesome. I just don't believe it's true. Uh, The pursuit of an entirely stress-free life is not a godly pursuit, nor is it even really a good goal. Um, But what we do have right off the bat are some promises of God that in the middle of your stress, you can have peace. In fact, Jesus said these words in John 16. He said, I have told you these things. When it's in a different color, read that out loud with me. So that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So what does Jesus promise? Not that all of your stress will go away, but in the middle of your storm, in the middle of the trouble, you can have a peace that the Bible says passes your own human understanding. Not only do we have a promise of God's peace in the middle, but I really believe as Christians, we can also have an expectation of deliverance. Psalm 34 verse 19 says it this way. Let's say it together. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, 
but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So God won't take away the stress sometimes, but what happens is he gives you the capacity in the middle of the stress to stand strong, not only with his peace, but with an expectation that he'll deliver you. In fact, the the Hebrew word for afflictions there is taken from an Assyrian form of torture where they would literally stand somebody up on a pole and they would torture them by placing rocks on top of their head, rock after rock after rock until until it caused them to die. And I think that image is what a lot of us metaphorically or figuratively feel like as we're coming into church this morning. That if you just place one more thing on top of me, I'm gonna lose it. If if one person asks me to do one more thing, I'm gonna just crumble. A lot of us come into this Sunday with lots of problems and real stress and you're trying to put a smile on and do the best that you can when on the inside many are hurting. So I want to make sure you leave today with those promises and some hope, peace in the middle, expectation that you are not alone, but I also want to teach you some principles today. In fact, my goal in this sermon is I actually want to cut half of your stress. How many of you would sign up for that? 35 minutes, cut half my stress, take it, yeah. I wanna cut half of your stress, which I think is unnecessary, and then with the other half, I wanna, at the end, give you a vision and a promise that you can cling to. And here's the reality. What I'm gonna share with you, I believe in everything that I'm gonna share, the concepts, the principles. Cutting half of your stress, I'm gonna make it sound easy. It is very hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. And so my my challenge as you're listening, um, as we get going, is to choose your hard. Choose your hard, like choose to endure everything that you're going through until you crumble, or choose to do the hard work of eliminating maybe half of your stress and put in the necessary work. So let's get really practical. What are we talking about today? I want to answer three questions. Number one, where is all of this stress coming from? We're going to spend a good chunk of our time isolating where our stress is coming from today. Number two, how can I then eliminate unnecessary stress? And then number three, uh, what can I do when I still have stress? So first, let's talk about where is all of this stress coming from? And since it's Mother's Day, I want to go ahead and do an illustration. And I want to bring a uh, mom up with her two assistants. One is her husband and the other is the youngest daughter. Let's give it up for the Millen family. Let's give it up for the Millen family. This family is one in a million. One in a million. Uh, Yeah, I just thought of that. It wasn't great. Uh, I'm going to have you guys over here. No, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. Um, Carrie is the mom. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. I want you right. Yeah, right. You're right here. You're right here. You're right here. Yep. There you go. Uh, It's Mother's Day. And so I want to illustrate some stresses that I think moms have. Now, fair warning. uh, I don't know if you know this. I'm not a mom. But I know some moms in my life, too, and I also know how to chat GPT and find out what stresses moms out. Yeah. And, and, and so what I'm going to have uh, your husband, Dave, who's really tall, which is really great, and uh, your youngest daughter, Zoe, is uh, they're going to be adding stressors to your life through these boxes. Does that sound okay? And we're going to see how much you can hold. I think you're super mom. I think you can do really well. And so I've got different... She's been training for years for this. All right, I've got boxes here. Uh, Dave, you can, you can give this one. Um, this is kid number one. Kid number one. And Zoe, you are kid number two, right? Yeah, you're, that's smaller. Less stress than your older, older sister, right? Is that accurate or not? She give you less stress or more? You don't want to answer. Okay, that's good. You don't have to answer. Let's go. Uh, let's go, Dave. Let's, let's just go every other here if it makes sense. Uh, work and family balance. That's a, that's a big one right there, isn't it? Work and family by, uh, balance. Uh, Zoe, you can add extended family. Uh, some of you in-laws is the highest box. It would be the biggest. Um, her parents are here right now. Her parents are here. Okay. Well, good luck. Um, all right. This is friends. Friends are a good source. I mean, some of you might have bad friends, and that would be a lot bigger, but anyway, you got good friends in your life, I bet. Uh, this is keeping up the house. This is a big one in my household. Allison likes to keep our house really good. So that's a big box. Um, this is inside of keeping up the house. Here, Zoe, you can place this. Um, this is just dishes. That's a small piece of keeping up the house. Yeah, that's a small piece. Um, yeah, this is kids doing the dishes, teaching them. 
It's actually really hard to do. Yeah, Zoe, you go ahead and do that one. Wow, this is impressive. Oh, wow. That's okay. We're going to keep going for a little bit. Um, I was actually going to add this one to the top. Yeah, let's go ahead and add that. This one is, the size of this is representative in my life. This is husband. Here. I need you to put husband on there. Um, we're holy men. She, my wife's married to a pastor, so she doesn't get much stress there. Uh, oh, here we go. This is husband's ideas, managing all of them. Yeah, that's a big one there. And then let's throw calendar. Let's move quickly here. Calendar, figuring all that out. Um, part of the calendar is kids' sports. So go ahead and add this. Yeah, we'll just throw that up there. Um, yeah. Uh, this is a big one for most people, finances. That might be the biggest for some people, uh, which is really good. What do I want to add here? I want to add, oh, keeping up with appearance. Mom's got to look good. They got to look good. Uh, vacation is a vacation is a fun thing, but it adds stress sometimes. We like to do home-cooked meals at our house. Um, this is a big one, honestly, for everybody. Uh, this is a true one. Unresolved sin. You got a lot of that, Dave, so go ahead and put that up there. Uh, what happened? I was still, I wasn't done. I wasn't done. Let's give it up for these guys. Come on. Don't worry about cleaning up this mess. No, you don't need to kick them off. Thank you, Millen family. Whew, I was exhausting myself. Dave serves on our Board of Lay Ministry, which is another reminder. Get those votes in. Board of Lay Ministers, thank you for all you do to serve at our church, but... Uh, maybe you're not a mom or maybe like you wish this Mother's Day that you had a kid to stress you out. That's a real thing. But all of us have a lot of stressors in our life. But I think you could boil it down to the three main culprits. Like a lot of these boxes fit into these three culprits. Relationships, time, and money. So I want to talk about each of those relationships. This could be the number one stressor in your life because, well, people are difficult, aren't they? Uh, we all deal with difficult people in our life. And if, by the way, you don't have anybody difficult in your life, uh, let me share something with you. You are the difficult person we're all dealing with. <laughs> so get a handle on it, please. Uh, <laughs> Here's something I've learned in relationships. You can't be everything for everybody. You were not designed to be everything for everybody. There is a longing and desire that only God can fill. And I, I just feel so many moms hearing that truth today and that freedom coming off of them. You can't even be everything for your child. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to say this together. Say, I cannot be everything for everybody. Come on, let's say it again, both campuses. I cannot be everything for everybody. And so this may sound harsh initially, but what we're going to do with relationships is we're going to decide ahead of time who gets to be in relationship with you and at what level. Pre-decide. A lot of research shows that you can only have really five to ten intimate, deep relationships in life. And again, it may sound harsh, but this is what Jesus did, right? He had a group of 72 disciples that followed after him, that gave the, him a lot of their time. But of the 72, he had a, a more known 12. And even in that 12, he had an inner three, Peter, James, and John. And even then, he still got a way to be with the one God the Father. Decide ahead of time who gets to be in relationship with you and at what level. This really came to head for Allison and I, I think in probably the summer of 2018. I'd been running hard for eight years leading a church in Florida, and they gifted me a three-month sabbatical. And in that sabbatical, I didn't realize how hard I'd been running. And at that point, uh, I, my relationships had gotten out of whack, and a lot of it from the work level. So I was spending so much time in relationship with those at work that God and my family weren't getting my best. And so somewhere over the course of the three months of my sabbatical, someone talked me through the wisdom of an organizational chart. At that point, I, was, I had 15 staff at the cross, and every single one of them reported to me. And so when I went back from the sabbatical, I had this new organizational chart, and all of a sudden I had four direct reports. And while that was a lot easier to manage and, and a lot less stressful to manage four than 15, it really made a lot of people mad. Some of the staff left because of that decision. 
And by the way, it wasn't easy for me either to, uh, I had to realize I gotta let, actually if I want God to do something, I gotta let go of all the control that I somehow I've built in for myself. And so I'm not, you've heard me say, choose your heart. None of the decisions we're making today are easy decisions. But decide ahead of time who gets to be in relationship with you and at what level. When it comes to the next one, let's go to time. I think we got to get a grip on how we spend our time. And so my pastor hat on here, let me just say this as plain as I can. You can't do everything that you are currently doing. So, so let me say that with you together. Come on, let's say that out loud together. I cannot do everything that I am currently doing. One more time like you believe it. I cannot do everything that I am currently doing. And so just like relationships, here's what you do. You decide what you are going to do ahead of time. Because I've noticed that if you don't have intentionality behind and uh, with your calendar, other people's priority will all of a sudden become your priority. I've preached this before, and, and so someone in Jeff sent an email, but I, I, I said uh, that I've never had anybody email me and say, hey, Zach, um, I need you to spend five extra hours on your sermon so that you can make it awesome for us on Sunday. People don't send emails like that to me, and, and except after I preach in jest and not in sincerity. Uh, what they send is, I need help immediately. Hey, can you be here? Hey, I need someone to listen. Hey, I need advice. Hey, can you show up here? Hey, I just need a little bit of your time. And you get that too. They'll text you. They'll, they'll Facebook message you. They'll phone call you. They'll try to get a hold of you any which way. And if you don't take care of your priority, you won't be able to help with theirs. Because honestly, I want to help in those situations. That's what we're here for is to serve one another. But you can't do it if you're not taking care of what's most important in your life. This one really came to a head for Allison and I in late 2016. This was the first time in our marriage that we needed to seek professional help because we were just missing each other. And it, it felt really weird as a pastor to admit to my church, uh, our marriage needs help professionally. I wanna kinda normalize, by the way, professional help, especially with a message like this. That's what we have a core counseling center here for at church, and so if you wanna go deeper here, uh, we have a great set of counselors that help with this very things we're talking about today, right? And so we went in to see the counselor, and here's the reality. Alice and I knew what he was gonna say to us. We knew he was going to say, you guys have too much going on and you need to cut some things out of your life. Do you know what he said? You have too much going on and you need to cut something out of your life. And he said, to get specific, here's my homework for you. By the next time you see me, each of you need to say no to three things in your life and tell me what those things are. And I said, well, if I say no to you, does that count as one of my three? <laughs> you laughed, he didn't and neither did Allison. Turns out we had to go to counseling later for why I always deflect in serious situations of humor, but whatever. <laughs> but we took, it, we took his words super serious. And we came back and, and we said, we, we've said no to some things. For Allison, it meant saying no to her career for a while. She was a fabulous kids minister at the cross. She led our kids ministry the first five years and she was qualified. She studied for it. She grew that thing. She was so good at it. But the position needed her to move from part-time to full-time and we had made a decision ahead of time that when our kids were young, we weren't both gonna work full time. That was a priority for us, our kids. And so she said no to her career. I said no, I had an, I had an online business for 15 years selling golf stuff online. There was a pretty significant source of our income still to that day. And I said I'm gonna let go of that so I can step more fully into the places where I need to be. Both of those decisions, this is not easy, were hard and difficult and sacrificial, and we took a pretty significant haircut financially to do those things. But our time was more valuable to us, which let's, that goes right into money. Money, if there's ever going to be a source of stress, <laughs> this is it. Even in a nation where we're experiencing incredible prosperity collectively, money is the top stressor in so many people's lives. It is the number one reason people fight in marriages today. Not parenting, not in-laws, not who does the dishes, it's money. Agreed. Yeah, everybody's talking about money. And so even though many have been blessed with this financial gain, I bet what I'm about to say is true for 99.9% .9 of us in the room, that you can't buy everything that you want to buy. So let's say this out loud together. I cannot buy everything that I want to buy. 
One more time. I cannot buy everything that I want to buy. And so here's what we're going to do. Just like relationships, just like time, we're going to decide ahead of time how and what we will spend our money on. And in the financial world, did you know they actually have a word for this? Do you know what it is? Budget. Like half of you know, half of you don't. This is new for you. (laughs) Praise God, you're learning something. And so... Allison and I really had to look at our own circumstances in that place. And we, we even though had a, like a, kind of a flexible budget, when we looked back, we realized, gosh, there's a lot of money that's just not going in strategic places. And we kind of felt a little bit of guilt. I did at least a little guilt and shame around that. I love what Pastor Andy Stanley says around this topic. He says that you should be a knowing where your money is a going. <laughs> and so because of the decisions we made, then we had to look at our finances and we, we had to come up with not just a budget, but what are truths for us? And the first and foremost is we want to be as generous as we possibly can to God's work. Because every time I've given to God's work, even here at King of Kings, when, when you give to King of Kings, good things happen. Lives are transformed. And I love being a part of that. I want that as much as I, I can for me and my family. And that means a couple other things, that we need to eliminate as much debt as we possibly can. And so we got real serious about paying off our personal cars. We switched our home mortgage from a 30-year to a 15-year just to get out of debt earlier. Did that same thing here in Nebraska before we learned that there's property taxes here, which is basically like a second mortgage anyway. So we'll never get out of that as long as we live in this dreaded, uh, I mean, awesome state. Anyway, but we limit, eliminate as much debt as possible. And then third, we also need to have as much financial margin as we can. A year and a half after I let go of that online business, all of a sudden we had a new business called Red Letter Living that I never saw coming. And, and, and if you're a business owner, you understand, an entrepreneur, you understand not every month is the same, far from it. There are good months, there are bad months, there are great months, there are months where you are biting your nails wondering, God, am I doing the right thing? And it's really good to have margin for those times when things aren't quite where they need to be. Relationships, time, and money. What I want you to hear is you can't be haphazard about these things. It requires intentional, careful, difficult decisions that many times require sacrifice. But deciding ahead of time, I really believe will eliminate stress in your life. Another reason why I chose those three things is it's not like you can just let go of them all the way. <laughs> you need relationships. You, there's time right now in this world and you gotta have money to live. And so now that we know what those three main culprits are, how can you eliminate unnecessary stress? I've got a question that I think can cut half of your stress, just like that. And when I say just like that, it's not like that. It's like, it's a process. You've got to endure. Choose your heart. So I've got a question. Do uh, you want to hear what this question is? Such a weak response here <laughs> at I Street. Northwest Omaha, I bet, is just on the edges of their seats there. I guarantee you, because I said, if you could eliminate half of your stress, wouldn't you be open to that? Wouldn't you put your phone away? Wouldn't you elbow your spouse and say, we're going to cut half of our stress, babe. So let me ask again, are are you ready to hear this question? Thank you for your pity. I always take it. (laughs) Always take your pity. So here's the question when it comes to relationships, time, money, a three word question that will change your life. Here it is. Is it wise? Let's say it out loud together. Is it wise? It's a game changer question. Is it wise? Probably the, the deeper question underneath that then would be, how do I make wise decisions? And what's amazing is, remember, we just came out of a book called James, where in the very first chapter, five weeks ago, from the stage, we heard this verse read out loud, that if any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. We have a God that doles out wisdom to us. What an amazing God he is. And so let's continue to put in the hard work. What is wise according to God? Here are a couple pieces when it comes to wisdom that I think will help you make wise decisions is really... Number one, you have to discover your purpose in life. You have to know why you live in this world, why you exist, what what this whole thing is all about and how you fit into that. There's a beautiful proverb from Solomon that um, 
that, that a lot of people use in business circles or even in church circles, but I think it's true of our own personal life too. It's from Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Other translations say where there is no vision, the people perish, or where there is no vision, the people run wild. And this is what happens. When you're not acting with wisdom, you're running every which way. You don't know if you're making wise decisions or not until you know what your purpose is in this life. And I really believe your purpose is to honor and glorify God with everything that you do, to be a follower of Christ. That's your main purpose. And then after you discover that and learn the wisdom that it takes to live in that, uh, then it just becomes keeping first things first. Priority issue. Because there's a lot of things in this world. So much. And when I read God's word, it feels like I gotta put God first. Feels like then the family's gotta come next. And then some combination of probably all the other stuff. But Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So let me quickly run through those relationships, time and money real quickly with a lens of discovering your purpose and understanding your priority and and what difference that could make. So if we start with relationships, if you know your purpose, if you know you're here to be a follower of Christ, then if you are single but dating, here's what you won't do. You won't date somebody that doesn't believe or follow after Jesus because the Bible says that's not wise. It's just not wise. Um, if you're in a marriage right now and you're struggling, I can't tell you how many people I've counseled in marriage over the years and some of them have, have committed the offense, the affair. They have cheated on their spouse. It's awful, it's terrible. But you know what an affair is? It's a one horrific unwise decision after a thousand other unwise decisions led up to it. And if at any point in the whole process someone would have asked, a Christian would have asked, the Christian that committed the offense would have asked, is this wise for me to do? No would have stopped. If you're a student in new high school or new college, or maybe you're going to a new workplace and you're going to be meeting new people, I think every person you meet, you need to look at in the lens of, is this wise that this is one of the most important people in my life or not? It's a good question to ask. When it comes to time, is it wise? I think a lot of us would realize that maybe the way we're spending our time isn't quite as wise as we want it to be. We have priority. Again, God first, family next, and then some combination of personal care and career and hobbies. And and so I love golf. I love golf. But is it wise for me to play golf if I haven't invested in my family? No, it's not. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a dad or a mom, and I've got two kids that are in their faith formative years, is it wise for me to plan Sunday morning activities away from church and not go to church? No, it's not. I want to put my kids around the word of God. I need that. Heck, I need that for my own life, let alone my kids, to look how we're spending our time. And then, of course, money. Uh, if we know we're, our purpose and put God first, then it changes how, how we spend our, our money. Uh, listen, I know that right now, um, I, c- I have multiple credit cards. I have a really good credit score. I could go out later today and buy a souped-up Tesla, and I would love that. That would be awesome. I don't think Allison on Mother's Day would appreciate that I got myself a souped up Tesla on her day. But that, that, that's not wise for me. Uh, we've made decisions, that would, that would be a knock on all three of our decisions to give generously to God's work, to, to, to um, eliminate debt. No, that wouldn't be good at all. And to live with margin, that, that would hurt at all of those. Plus there's a segment of people that don't even think pastors should have nice things and I'd have to answer that all my life. Just not willing to do that, it's not wise. So I'll drive my Honda till I die. Is it wise? I think you could cut half of your unnecessary stress if you get that question right. Times we know it's wise and we still go the other direction, not add stress. There are times we know what's wise and others make difficult decisions and that adds to our stress. Some of you are super stressed out about all the things that I just put on you. Relationships, time, money. I got 20 boxes of stress that I could name 20 more. And, and then I got to figure out, is it wise? And I got relationships and time and money and which one do I start with and how do I do this? And some of you are like overwhelmed by even what I shared with you today. 
And again, I come back to, it's not easy. Choose your heart. For Alice and I, this was probably a four-year process for those three words. And, and, it, and when I look back, five, 10, 15 years, we have way less stress than we used to. But there are still difficult seasons where it feels like stress is right back. And I am in one of those right now where I know all the right answers and I know how to preach it. Man, I am feeling under the weight of a lot of stuff this very moment. So you could, you could nail the first 30 minutes of my message. You could crush it. And yet, you'll still find stress finds you. So what do you do? One of the most often quoted non-Bible verses that people think is a Bible verse is this line. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not in here. It's fake. It's not in the word of God. Uh, The truth is that God will never give you more than he can handle. So the question for you is, is it wise? Is it wise to carry all of this by yourself? Let's be smart and strategic and cut as much as we can out, yes. But even when it comes on you, is it wise for you to carry all of this? When not only do you have the promise of God that you can have peace in the middle of a storm, peace in the middle of stress, and when you have the expectation of delivery, but, but you also have a God that invites you to give all of this to him. Jesus says these words in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, And I didn't have this until this morning, and so it's not on the screen, so just listen to the words of Jesus for you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Add on top of that, overwhelmed, depleted, anxious, stressed. Come to me. Here's what he says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How good is that? That we have a God that says, come to me when you're feeling any of these things. And here's kind of Jesus' weird, ironic answer is come to me when you're weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So Jesus says, come to me and and put something on you. And we're like, "That, that seems backwards, God. Take my yoke upon you. And so we have to look at it. What is a yoke? And it, yes, it is the inside of an egg, but that's not what we're talking about today. All right, y'all? What's a yoke? It was, a, it was an instrument that went around a couple of animals that helped them walk together while they worked. This was something that they could be more productive as they worked together while they worked. Because God has work for you. And so the yoke then is, is I'm going to attach myself to you. That as you walk and as you work, you don't have to carry all of these things yourself. You've got someone that's willing to walk right alongside of you that, newsflash, is way stronger than you are. He invites you to give all of these to him. The disciple Peter even said it this way, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I love a fisherman using the word cast. Throw it over to Jesus' side because that guy cares for you. And that guy, he is powerful and he is strong and he knows what it's like to pack a lot on his back. And so I don't know what you've been carrying. You're going to keep carrying stuff because you're never going to get a stress-free life. It's not the point. But the point is you've got a God says as you're walking I'll walk with you and so if you're feeling a little bit of stress as we walk together throw it over to my side every now and then you'll have to take it back and do some things in this world but give it to me give it to me let us not forget how strong our God is that he took all of my worst 
all of your worst, every sin that I've ever committed, every bad thing I've ever done, every bad thing I've ever said, every bad thought I've ever thought, every, every good thing I haven't done and every good thing I haven't said, he took all of that and he put it on his back when he went to the cross. Add on top of that your sin. Add on top of that your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your Facebook friends, your TikTok followers. Add on top of that everybody in the city of Omaha, in the state of Nebraska, in the country of the United States, in the world today. Add on top of that not just those that are presently living, but all those who have lived and will ever live in the future. Every single sin of the entire world was hoist upon the back of the one that says, take my yoke upon you, I'll walk with you. Why wouldn't we give all of that over to him? It's no wonder that the earth shook and the sun blot when Jesus was on the cross and all the Father's anger of every sin was on his son's back. And the lights went out. And three days later, the lights turned on because our God is strong and mighty. He gives you peace as you walk in the middle while you work and you can expect deliverance because this is just what our God does. So let's cut stress as much as we can. But even when it comes, let's know that we are not alone. We walk with the one that is strong and mighty. Will you stand at both locations? Let me pray for you. God, we thank you this Sunday on Mother's Day for this reminder that we are not alone, that you walk with us. I pray, Jesus, that when we're stressed, We would not escape to the things of this world. That we would not escape to Netflix and sports and vacation and all these things which are fine in and of themselves. But that's not rest for our soul. Rest for our soul doesn't come with escape from you. It comes by tethering ourselves to you. And we thank you that, Jesus, you've done everything that's possible for us to walk alongside of you. Thank you that you went to the cross and paid the price for all of our sins. All of our unwise decisions were met at the cross that day. And all of those were nailed to the cross and buried in the tomb. And so we choose not to walk alone, but with you guiding us in our future. For God, you are worthy of it all. And we love you. And we thank you that when we battle and when we fight against stress, we don't do it alone. We do it with you. We love you, Jesus. And both campuses said, amen.